Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Humana's presentation on doing the mainframe DevOps. Um, I'm Andrew Foster. I'm director of uh, the DevOps and Enterprise Engineering Enablement team here at Humana. Um, and we are very focused on uh, Humana's mainframe engineer experience and how we can make that better. Uh, and overall, using that experience also improve uh, the overall products that are delivered for our members to leverage each and every day. Gaurav, I wanted to toss it to you to do a quick intro. Sure. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Hello, everyone. My name is Gaurav Jaju, and my role here at Humana is lead applications architect. I work uh, in Andrew's organization, and I am primarily responsible for uh, leading DevOps efforts around uh, core platforms like mainframe and no-code, low-code platforms like Salesforce. Over to you, Andrew. Great. Thanks, Gaurav. So before we get too deep into DevOps around uh, the mainframe, I wanted to just give the audience a quick overview of Humana. Um, so Humana is a top 50 uh, health and wellness company. Um, and you notice I didn't say the word insurance there. Uh, we view ourselves more than just a traditional insurance and healthcare company. We're very focused on uh, the overall wellness of our members and how we can help them uh, in their everyday life. Uh, so just a little bit of context, we do have uh, our, our primary business is serving Medicare Advantage members. We have 4.5 million of uh, those folks. Um, we also serve our active duty and veteran military families through our military offerings. Um, and we offer group insurance and other standalone wellness products uh, like Go365 as well. So again, very focused on wellness at Humana. Um, and, you know, we're very excited and encouraged to serve our members health each and every day. Now I'll uh, transitioning slides. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the organization that Guarav and I uh, work as part of. We are part of a program and organization called High Performance Engineering here at Humana, um, and we're very focused each and every day on how we can serve our customers, internal customers, if you will, um, which are Humana's engineers. Um, and Humana's engineers, uh, you know, are delivering new products and features to our members every day. Uh, which which benefit and serve them and their healthcare experience. And we're focused on how we can serve uh, the Humana engineers and make them more productive and uh, overall increase their engineer experience, uh, which we feel like really um, will, at the end of the day, help Humana's products grow uh, and become more stable and reliant and also just deliver the value that, that they need to have uh, to effectively serve our members. So um, we are specifically in the DevOps function um, within high performance engineering. You can see that uh, within our program, uh, there are multiple work streams. Uh, each, you know, we could lovingly call this diagram the honeycomb. Um, each piece and part of the honeycomb is focused on um, a different part of the overall engineering experience. Um, again, with DevOps, we sit in the middle and, and kind of help to stitch all of those things together. What we're showing uh, the audience here today uh, is, is Humana's overall engineer experience for a mainframe engineer. Um, so we have one of these diagrams for um, every uh, kind of high level tech stack, right? Open system, Salesforce. Um, today, we're here to speak with you all primarily about the mainframe experience that we built um, for our engineering community. Um, and you'll, you'll, if I kind of work this diagram left to right, uh, you'll see that um, it's very focused around uh, Humana's SDLC or software delivery lifecycle. Um, we've aligned our tooling uh, to the SDLC. Um, and, and, you know, the, the intention here is to just show how the, the CompuWare BMC, um, sorry, the BMC CompuWare stack um, fits together to form this ecosystem and how we've integrated it with our other DevOps product suites across the, our broad ecosystem. Um, first thing I'd just like to tell the audience, um, you know, we're talking about mainframe today. Humana has almost every technology stack at play you can think of um, within our ecosystem. And so, you know, stitching these things together and providing a very streamlined experience for the engineers is, is something that, you know, we're really passionate about um, in, in the enterprise engineering enablement team. Um, you know, we think and believe that uh, happy engineers uh, equal productive engineers, right? So we want our engineers to, to be super, um, come into work, be excited about the tool set that they're using and be able to do their job in as frictionless as a way as possible. So hopefully you'll see that today as we kind of deep dive um, this engineer experience and walk you through some of the specifics of what we've built. Uh, but just covering it at a high level, um, we have a, a suite of um, agile management tools, um, including uh, Jira Line uh, for kind of that portfolio management level. 
Um, Azure boards though, uh, which is part of the Azure DevOps suite is really where um, engineers are working day to day, consuming their work and um, delivering, you know, consuming the work that ultimately delivers Humana's products. Um, as we step over into the build phase, right, when we actually start the development lifecycle, um, we see that there's quite a few um, BMC computer tools here. Um, the to Topaz Workbench is our primary IDE for mainframe engineers, and that includes a suite of um, kind of built-in products to help ensure that that code uh, that's getting written um, is as efficient and, re and resilient as it can be. Um, we store our source code within the ISPW platform. Um, and then we leverage a combination of Jenkins and ISPW to do our uh, continuous integration builds. Um, and those do happen on demand and include um, code quality inspection um, using SonarCube, right? And that's also built into IDE as well with, uh, with the SonarLint plugin. So we're, you know, doing, doing everything we can to both make it easy for engineers, but also ensure that there's some safeguards and, and, and you know, guardrails, if you will, in place uh, around the process. Um, when we move into the accept phase of, of the SDLC, you'll see that we've got several testing tools there. Obviously, we're using ISPW to promote um, the mainframe changes from environment to environment. Um, and then we've got a, a suite of test tools that are also leveraged as well um, to track and record um, test cases and bugs and defects. And this is a very iterative process, right? I'm showing it here more in a linear flow, but um, it's very much an iterative uh, process as teams are working in, in agile methodologies all across Humana. Um, when you move into the deploy phase, uh, really interesting innovation um, that we've put on top of our uh, DevOps ecosystem. Um, we're, we're using uh, ISPW, of course, to orchestrate the, the code changes to the production environment. Um, but a little bit of a Humana special sauce is, is the product that we've developed that we call the Greenlight API. And we'll dig into that much deeper on the next slide, but um, you'll see that the Greenlight API actually um, integrates what I would call ITIL or change management best practices into the DevOps pipeline so that as engineers are uh, promoting their software, um, all of the process controls and checks that um, a highly regulated, a company like Humana that operates in a highly regulated, highly audited industry um, requires to be there right for the software uh, to be promoted. Um, all of those checks are incorporated in the DevOps pipelines um, and sitting on top of a platform like ISPW um, with uh, just kind of natively, right? It's built in. It's something that the engineers do. They get the feedback right through the pipeline. Um, if there's a test case that was missed or a, some kind of process check that wasn't completed, um, they'll get that notification. They can rectify it themselves and then resubmit for the release. Um, once Greenlight API signs off uh, on the given release, uh, we also have an integration that was enabled between the ISPW and ServiceNow platforms to automatically open change orders for engineers and allow them to um, really not have to leave their their home, right? Their interface that they know and love, which is, you know, the Topaz and ISPW experience. So we wanted to really keep them where they're most efficient and out of some of the other process tools. Um, so really exciting. We'll dig into some of those checks on the next slide, but, um, you know, kind of completing, we're working through, um, yeah, well, sorry, Gaurav, I was going to kind of talk through the other okay. portions, but um, no, you're, no, you're fine, man. Um, but just quickly, the run and feedback, we do leverage Dynatrace and Splunk um, to, for some of those operational metrics, but that just kind of completes the loop for the mainframe experience. Um, all right, Gaurav, let's hit the next slide, man. Sure. Thank you, sir. Um, all right, so digging in a little bit deeper on Greenlight API, and then I'll uh, toss it to Guarov to dive into some of the specifics around uh, our mainframe um, experience. So Greenlight API essentially codifies Humana's SDLC, right? So we're putting all of the process checks. If you if you work the diagram from left to right, kind of around around the um, around the infinity sign there, um, you'll see that Greenlight API sits right in the middle, right? So each step of the SDLC plan, build, accept, feedback there. There are different checks that uh, get injected into the um, into the life cycle, and that you know we're ensuring that engineering teams are adhering to. Um, and this this is a great partnership um, between you know our DevOps area uh, and high performance engineering and our our friends in change management. Um, great partnership to to develop this framework and um, you know automate these process checks. So just kind of calling out that th this is really what's unlocked DevOps for us here at Humana, whether it be mainframe or open systems, you know, having the ability to ensure that 
um, you know, we've got safety as we move to production and that we're following all of our audit and compliance requirements, um, and, but we're doing it in an automated way. Um, that's what's really important and what's really unlocked uh, a lot of, uh, of movement and adoption of um, the mainframe ecosystem that Guarov is about to show you and, and deep dive in on. Um, the last thing I'll say on, on this topic, um, because of the, the great work that has happened at Humana, um, we now have the capability to uh, release uh, to production uh, multiple times per day in a safe and secure way. Um, so we've enabled our, our engineering teams to fully self-service, um, you know, release their software, get that benefit out to our members as quickly as possible. Because at the end of the day, um, I say as quickly as possible, as quickly as possible in a safe and secure way, right? We want to ensure the, protect our production environment, um, but also ensure that, you know, at the same time, you know, we are able to iterate quickly and, and get those features and new capabilities out to our members, which is, you know, ultimately um, when the value is realized. So, um, Gaurav, anything you would add, man, on anything that I said? Otherwise, I'll toss it to you. No, that sounds good. Great. Take it away. All right. So uh, now jumping over onto uh, what we have done so far in the mainframe space when it came, uh, comes to DevOps. So we actually went through a long journey. Uh, so for four years back, if you would ask me, we were still doing manual releases. Our SCM tool was Panvillet. And we realized, uh, though very late in the game, that it is not scalable and it does not allow us to bring in a lot many more capabilities if we are eyeing DevOps even on mainframe side. So back then, uh, it's not that uh, CompuWare ISPW became an obvious choice. We went through a series of POCs. We even uh, assessed uh, IBM Rational Tool stack uh, and CompuWare uh, uh, ISPW against the same criteria. Uh, but uh, as a result of that POC, uh, from our perspective, computer scored higher than a rational, and that is how it became tool of choice. But then uh, moving along, uh, there was still a lot of work to be done uh, because the bare bone tool uh, obviously does not uh, come with all the patterns which are being applicable in our shop, right? So, and then at the same time, we just do not uh, wanted to do a plain simple lift and shift, like the way we were functioning on panel was not the exact way we wanted to run on ISPW. So then came an exercise of app assessment. So what we did is like we went through all our Humana mainframe assets and identified, uh, we set up a criteria, like uh, what assets do we see uh, running for a longer future compared to the ones who are potential to be retired or replaced with an alternate technology so that way we can cut down uh, our scope. Second thing is like uh, going through the patterns, we realize uh, the tool uh, as such is not expected to support each and every pattern. Like for example, we do some of uh, cool gen stuff as well with some of our applications, which is not a native integration with the ISPW. So that helped us define some exclusions. And after that, uh, it was uh, another journey because we were so much uh, deeply invested in Panvillet, we had to define certain processes, which became a prerequisites for uh, ISPW adoption. So team worked uh, pretty hard uh, coming up with some tools so that we are not uh, investing a lot of effort just in coming out of Panvillet to be ready for ISPW. So a lot of cell server tools were developed uh, that cuts down the development effort significantly. Like I can convert an application from uh, with thousands of co components, um, maybe within two to three minutes of uh, time execution and my new code base is ready, which is gonna do the exact same thing, but considering PDSE as a background. Uh, and then uh, obviously testing and uh, move to production was another step which was done. And after that, our uh, apps, whichever were identified, were kind of ready. Then started our adoption journey. So while we were doing this app assessment, we just didn't stop uh, for assessment to complete. We actually uh, reached out to a bunch of application groups to be early adopters. The primary reason was to identify the gap. Uh, like I can think from one perspective, but to have a full view, 
we needed the actual uh, participants to be using the tool and giving us real time feedback. That is why you see on uh, number two, uh, why are we started all of this process in 2017, where we uh, kept on bringing some uh, simpler applications based on the experience we added, uh, kept on adding more and more feedback. But if you see the real spike started sometime in 2020, and that is where we felt like we are pretty much ready uh, to go big time. And then uh, uh, again, we wanted uh, this activity to be completed within a stipulated time frame. So we ended up uh, creating a OKR around it that by so and so date, every application who has been deemed as eligible to migrate should migrate. And uh, our team is gonna help you with all that process. So we worked with them defining their life cycles, which is uh, somewhat similar to how they function today. But wherever we could see a scope that, okay, uh, our focus was everything should be uh, following standards and our team should have a proper control rather than allowing teams to do and set up their own practices. So we transitioned teams. It was a big change. Uh, for a person doing same stuff for more than 20 years, asking them to start first start using the IDs and uh, 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 drag and drop uh, type of development you, uh, on Topaz Workbench uh, and then asking them to not uh, do certain processes the way they have been used to doing and start using these smart processes. But it took time, uh, but uh, I'm happy to say we are there now. And uh, recently in, uh, uh, by end of Q2 2021, we achieved our migration goal. So as of date, 99% of all Humana mainframe assets are running on Compute, BMC, ISPW, and the overall mainframe tool stack. But uh, during this adoption process, there was another thing. We just didn't want to uh, switch applications to start using the platform, but we also wanted them to go through some quality gates, pipeline style of development and all those things. So we shifted our focus in our um, 2019 end to come up with our uh, initial pipeline, which was basically like doing a set of validations uh, at the commit time itself whenever developer is ready to promote code to the next higher environment, certain quality gates should run. And if those gates are not met, uh, the pipeline itself forces code to be pushed back. You cannot uh, check in your code into a higher environment or a secured environment unless you are meeting certain criteria. So after we, uh, since we had a pattern established, once our initial pipeline was uh, set up, uh, adopting or uh, switching other applications to start using the platform was not that big of a deal. We were able to uh, get teams adopt to those pipelines very effectively and efficiently in no time. And then final thing, like Andrew mentioned, we recently uh, switched our focus in early 2021 that uh, though we have seen a success with Greenlight API and the automated releases on our uh, open systems, we wanted to bring in the same practices in the mainframe world. So we developed these integrations with um, Greenlight API and ServiceNow. And uh, I'll be uh, showing uh, you guys a, a deep dive demo on it or towards the end of presentation, but this is where we are. We had our first certified pipeline released in uh, July of 2021 and in three to four months of time, we are seeing a tremendous response from the application teams and um, pretty much everyone who, who is using ISPW is eligible to use pipelines are also using certified pipelines. So moving along, so how we prepared, like all this uh, adoption and everything would not have been possible if uh, we haven't provided resources to our engineers. And uh, by engineers, I mean like uh, within Humana shop, we have got like close to 750 mainframe engineers who are working primarily on the uh, IT side. Um, and I'm not even counting the administrative staff we have uh, maintaining the infrastructure. But for them to be successful, our team did put up a lot of effort in uh, doing uh, documentation, thorough documentation around what ISPW or the mainframe DevOps platform has to offer. Um, 
every other thing, uh, whatever we could think of is documented and hosted on our doc site, which not just only contains document for ISPW, but it even includes best practices recommendation around all the technology stack which our organization supports. Next thing was we even um, um, uh, leveraged our internal social media site, Yammer, uh, and uh, we created groups per technology stack per practice, wherever users need to engage or reach out to us, uh, or e even for the community building, uh, like basically engineer helping another engineer. They don't have to rely completely on my team every time. If someone else has an answer, go for it and answer it. That's how our dot culture started. Uh, also, we focused heavily on the self-learning aspect. So originally, uh, actually prior to COVID times, we actually had a very good engagement with uh, Computer Pro. So initially, every quarter we used to do in-person training uh, uh, with 30, 40, uh, 40 engineers attending an all-day session uh, with the Computer expert going through uh, uh, deep dive uh, uh, into this uh, tool sets. But we again realized that is again not sustainable. So we started recording those sessions and made it actually part of our, our training, our department curriculum. So all the mainframe engineers are expected to go through that uh, training uh, so that most of the questions get an answered uh, if you're well trained on, on a software. And not just uh, around ISPW to pass workbench, we focused on pretty much all the tools, whatever are integrating with our, our tool stack. And we recorded videos, micro learning uh, uh, videos, uh, whatever we can leverage from the vendor partners uh, and whatnot. Slideshows, screen, uh, screenshots. We even uh, keep on doing open office sessions uh, for anyone to attend, ask any question. And uh, they have been very successful. Last thing, early uh, in 2020, we partnered again with BMC and said that how can we take training to a next level? That is where we ended up coming up with the Humana specific curriculum stored on BMC Academy and uh, engineers whoever are interested in getting themselves a little uh, recognition from the vendor partner they are expected to go through this training. They can appear for an external accreditation certification exam, but BMC experts, if they do well, they get themselves a cool certificate, which I'm highlighting here. Uh, so moving along. So uh, enough of preparation and everything. Let's uh, talk about how uh, uh, pipelines do work in our shop. So what I'm uh, showing here on this uh, presentation are two sections, uh, actually four sections, but uh, I wanted to split up uh, uh, from the CI and CD aspect. So like I talked about at the inception level, we have this uh, continuous integration pipeline uh, in, uh, uh, hosted on Jenkins. So all the developer is expected to do is his day-to-day uh, -day development work using the tool stack we provide. Uh, and then at time of check-in or promoting it into a next hire environment, uh, our pipeline triggers um, at the promote level, which is uh, where it will uh, assess whether all the checks, whatever developer was expected to do, has he done it? Uh, and the quality gate is coming out good or not. If it does not come out good, it's going to not accept the code whereas will trigger a regress action and push back the code back to developer that you need to make certain changes before you can actually do a re-promote. So uh, I'll come to the second block later, uh, but uh, then the next thing is like this process uh, uh, repeats uh, between um, development level until prod minus one level within your pipeline. Next thing, uh, at prod minus one and prod level, between prod minus one and prod level, that happens is a trigger for green light API checks, which is essentially all our SDLC checks in an automated fashion. So here, developer again is expected to create a mainframe pull request, which is something new we developed, and that is what I'm showing in uh, second quadrant. So uh, this is where they will make a connection between Azure work items they are working on 
for which they are working on mainframe components with an ISPW. So this helps us tie uh, that uh, missing link. And this is where developer is gonna generate a unique identifier and plug it into his ISPW set promotion and key in some scheduling information where, when and uh, at what time they want that package to be executed. This process can be run uh, into a dry run mode as well. So for example, I just want to know how would I do when I'm actually about to do a release, I can very well trigger the process in the dry run mode. It will do everything give me a, a response and then email it's just that it won't uh, trigger a call to service now to create a system of uh, change record uh, letting others know that okay we are ready to promote to production but uh, if i do not want to run it and try run mode i'm pretty confident that i can just make a call out to that api and get myself a passing score and move on to the actual change and last thing is uh, in the fourth quadrant you are seeing is uh, even after this thing happens and uh, the code has made it to production, next thing we do is, uh, uh, since we are very uh, heavily relying on Sonar Cube for uh, quality measures, we always want to keep those projects uh, in sync. So whatever application has pushed a change into production, the moment it sees a prod turn, it directly uh, triggers a call for a re-baselining of source code onto Sonar Cube using Jenkins orchestration. And it will always keep uh, your um, source code, which is golden in uh, ISPW, as consistent with uh, Sonar Cube source code. And uh, since we have talked so much about uh, this release automation, uh, we have been trending all these uh, details into uh, a number of dashboards, but I'm sharing a glimpse of two of the main dashboards where the uh, first one is like uh, this API execution log. This provides you the end-to-end -end traceability in a single snapshot. So it will tell me like, what is my asset for which I'm uh, uh, doing your turn? What is my release URL, Glappy URL? How many test cases I had? What is the associated work item? Everything in a single view. Second thing is, uh, second dashboard you're seeing is a release automation. So it's uh, uh, this one does track release, uh, certified automated releases, not only for mainframe, but for every other platform who is actually integrating with Greenlight API and doing automated releases. So last uh, thing is like we, uh, during this uh, journey, we went through VSM activity a couple of times just to understand what is the ROI we are uh, getting out of all these changes. And in past two years, especially now with uh, adoption of certified releases, our numbers have uh, improved even further. Uh, and the best one, uh, or the, my favorite one is like a uh, reduction in the wait times. And especially uh, I'm, I feel very happy uh, seeing a tremendous increase in automated releases. So September usually is uh, a very heavy month uh, for Himana because we end up going into code freeze uh, between this uh, October to December due to our AP thing. So pretty much every other application, whoever is using whatnot platform has some changes in it to be done. And we notice 70% of our mainframe applications making use of certified releases. So that number uh, seemed pretty huge to me um, and it will um, keep on improving. So last but not least, I'm ready to do a, a quick demo. Hey everyone, so what you are seeing on my screen is Topaz Workbench. So we have talked about certified pipelines a lot in the last few minutes, but we actually wanted to show you exactly how that portion works and uh, what do we mean by automated releases. So what I have here is I've set up uh, an assignment container for one of my applications and I've uh, pulled up a very small change. It's a data card change just to show the capability exactly what happens uh, from the developer perspective. So uh, if you see, I have this AV99 container set up 
when I go in it, I see there is a one a card which is sitting at the staging environment or I should say prod minus one. And at this point in time, uh, me being a developer, uh, what are the actions required on my part to trigger a certified pipeline? So uh, let me switch over to my Greenlight API portal. Uh, uh, this is a connector uh, uh, interface. Like uh, what you will see on this portal is like all the applications who are authorized to make use of Greenlight API. So in this case, the application which I'm gonna use is DevOps mainframe. Uh, uh, this page actually shows you a lot of good information. So it is showing you the asset name uh, within our APM structure and the source system, technology type, and what level of pipeline uh, from Greenlight API perspective it does use. So we do have a leveling construct on our pipelines. So what we are seeing here is like this particular pipeline is certified as level three. So basically that means is like whatever, is applicable as a acceptable criteria by change management, this pipeline does follow uh, all of those uh, details. Apart from that, you are seeing the asset uh, ID, uh, which this application has on service now, and what the risk level score is. So next thing what I'm gonna do is like, I'll click on the select work items. Uh, this is a dedicated function we created for our mainframe pipelines. Uh, Primarily for one reason, because uh, our source code resides uh, on ISPW, not on Azure, but we still leverage Azure DevOps for work item traceability and uh, all the pr uh, project related uh, activities. So this acts as a connector where I can club all the work items, create a unique uh, ID uh, to trigger that uh, pipeline uh, call. And then internally, Greenlight API is gonna uh, uh, read that unique identifier uh, and uh, transpose it back into work items and uh, do the magic what it is supposed to do. So first thing I'm gonna do is like, uh, I'll be creating a new set. So I'll just give it a name as BMC demo and I'll hit enter. Next thing I'm gonna do is like add the work items from my uh, Azure work, uh, Azure DevOps uh, board. So my project within Azure DevOps is DevOps and I'm gonna key in one user story, which is actually reflecting the work we are gonna promote to production. Uh, uh, in our instance, we do leverage uh, both QTest and uh, uh, Azure test plans, but for this particular project in backend, all our test cases, defects and bugs are getting logged on QTest. And this selection is gonna help set up that traceability in an automated way. So I have this story, I have added it, and now my new set has created. So this is the unique identifier 261, uh, which has been created. Uh, this is all I got to do uh, as a developer on the Greenlight API portal. Now I can switch back to my workbench and uh, select this component. I can do it at component level, or I can even do it at a, a assignment container level. In this case, I'm using it at component level. I'll go select uh, advanced options and I'll do promote with options. And one thing I wanted to highlight is um, uh, out of box, there were no uh, webhooks which were available to uh, uh, be triggered at the approval level. So this is one of the partnership items. We worked with uh, BMC Compuware to have a dedicated trigger event created uh, considering this uh, requirement and um, very thankful to uh, the team uh, to getting it done within our stipulated time frame. So in order to trigger this pipeline for Greenlight API, what I'm gonna do is like we heavily rely on this description thing. So there is a dedicated format in which I should be passing this uh, information because once the webhook gets triggered, there is a, a action within the pipeline, which is gonna read this description and interpret uh, the GLAPI specific information. 
and by the way glappy is a short name for green light api so i'm just going to uh, get rid of this description and i'll paste the description in this particular format and i'll replace all ends with a uh, uh, 261 i believe was the number yeah uh and then if you see uh i do have u hyphen 261 dr uh so dr here stands for dry run so if i just i'm not pretty sure like whether i want to release the change right away or uh, then i can actually still do uh, all the things just to be sure whether the traceability and everything is going to come out good i can uh, run this uh, pipeline call in a dry run mode only thing it will not do is create a actual service not change ticket to support this deployment and have it implemented but for this demo i'm just going to get rid of dr and uh, make an actual call out next thing uh, i am required to fill up is i need to enter the schedule where at what time exactly do i expect this change to uh, be implemented like from that time and onwards so today's date is uh, Pretty, and I'm gonna select the time uh, as oh, for. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm gonna edit the time to be eleven fifteen EST, and that's all I do. So I'm gonna just uh, submit this uh, set promotion, and. Trigger the pipeline. At this point in time, I can actually come and go on to my Jenkins instance, uh, just for the sake of demonstration. The developer does not need to do that because they do get automated notifications as and when the pipeline completes. Uh, but I just go into the build history, and I see my pipeline is currently running. and uh or i can actually go into and so i'll put for a better view so it does some sort of uh, basic validations and then um, uh, at the ispw set level it will retrieve all the details from it Uh, uh here you are seeing the service now specific details which it has extracted and once it has everything it's going to make a call out to uh greenlight api which is uh hosted uh, uh, using azure functions and you know, once this is done it received a response that it was able to check everything and then it's going to pass control over to service now and get a change number created but one thing interesting to know is like what exactly did it change in background uh check in background so um green light api for mainframe pipelines at prod minus 1 to prod level is checking for work item traceability uh checking for the valid project whether uh that particular project is approved to make production changes or not and is uh, actually tied to this particular mainframe asset or not code quality it did um, refer the prior uh, lower level pipelines where we enforce the code quality scanning through sonar cube it would go make a call out um, to q test to do test case validations defects and bugs and then um, it will also uh, make a call out or uh, to another internal system just to check the operational risk like who knows um, our support teams might have listed uh, an exception that every time there is a production change getting pushed on this particular app they need to be part of this approval but looks like there is none listed on it so it's not going to bother them and, and and i would have also received an email notification for this uh build so if you see uh 
I am seeing an email notification that my uh, pipeline completed successfully uh, for an application app service ID and a particular unique identifier, and it has uh, created a change record for me. So at this stage, I would like to actually go into uh, that uh, service now and pull up that change request. So a uh, few things to note here. So we do leverage certified change templates. There is one template per mainframe asset created whenever it's actually making a use of uh, certified uh, pipelines. Next thing it would do is like it will fill out all the planning or the change management related information based on the template, what we have in place. And then um, we'll fill out the application release tab. Like, okay, for which application, what container, set number, all those things which are helpful for the actual implementation team to implement this change. It would have also plugged in the approval workflow, which we are seeing here. So at present, this is the implementation group who has been notified. So someone from that group should be uh, uh, acknowledging that they are ready to implement this change based on the way we have promoted. Some other automations we have set up between ServiceNow and ISPW are, uh, like if you see, um, first thing it does uh, at time of change creation is it's gonna populate the uh, uh, component list uh, within the node section. So uh, if, for example, I had multiple components, it would uh, create one uh, single record with uh, each component listed as a line item and the type of change uh, and the type of component. Other change we would see is like on this container, if you see, uh, this is one of our audit requirements where work rate column is something we are leveraging to uh, tie the connection between ISPW set and service now. So at present it shows blank, but if I refresh the screen, uh, it would have updated this change ticket number on this ISPW set. And at this time, it is just waiting on approval. Uh, implementation group approves the change uh, the, or actually acknowledges the change. There's just one single approval which is required from the owners of this uh, uh, mainframe asset group. And Let's refresh it and see if someone is actively looking into it. So uh, while we are waiting on that, so other things this pipeline is gonna do is uh, uh, once the approval happens uh, and the change actually gets implemented, uh, me as a, a developer would get notified that the implementation is complete and now I can go verify the production environment, whether I'm seeing that change or not. And once I'm satisfied with the change, I can come uh, back to service now and uh, I can just close this uh, change ticket and that will drive another uh, call out um, uh, to ISPW to actually close that uh, assignment container. Uh, so the developer is not expected to go and close the assignment containers as and when the change gets implemented, it can do that. And uh, one more thing to note here is like this pipeline can run at both assignment level as well as release level. So let's refresh it and see if it has been approved. see some action being taken and yes and this is the only approval who actually needs to uh, approve it uh, let me bring... so andrew in this case uh, is the actual owner of that uh, mainframe asset so uh, he or anybody else who is part of that uh, this uh, assignment group can approve it, but I have notified him since he's part of the presentation. 
once it gets approved, we should be able to proceed forward. All right, so it's been approved. And if you see on these uh, Chevron boxes, uh, the change has moved to the scheduled state. And since we already are within the approved time window, um, implementation group should be able to implement the change. So the, so the point here is like, even though we have been able to cut down uh, so many approvals since we are making user certified pipeline, but still uh, one or two approvals of whatever needs to happen, one by implementation group and one by the uh, CI owner is the actual time consuming uh, action. But apart from that, everything else goes pretty quick and that being said we are uh, having a capacity of releasing multiple changes as small as they can be or as big as they can be multiple times a day if we need to um, see uh, the group has actually went ahead and updated the status to implement if I go back to my workbench and do a refresh, implementation had brought successful. So if I see, so this component is now setting out production. I can uh, actually pull it up from here just to verify. And I do see it is setting out icw.prod.card and I can pull up the deployment tab just to verify. Set number versus. Yep, deployment also has been completed. Um, implementation complete. And it is now reflecting in a production environment. So uh, uh, you saw that how quickly the changes can be implemented through this overall process. Uh, no need for uh, manually uh, going through uh, other change management meetings because uh, the Greenlight API itself took care of all those actions. So now the only action, since I've verified the change, I can actually bring this uh into my review state and i can show you the final action so i'll just go ahead and bring this change into review and could have added a change task okay change implementation Close task. Try to be. I believe it would also add one moderation. Okay. Now it is in review state, and if I have to close this change, okay.
okay not this point in time i can actually go ahead and mark this change as successful uh, Close. The last action to show here is once this change is closed, so let's quickly review the notes here. Uh, change looks good. So, this is another trigger. So I was now made it back to uh, ASPW and it has now closed the assignment container. So I'll just go and switch back to my workbench and show you. So if I refresh it, that container is gone. And if I have to pull it back, I would actually click for show close containers. And this assignment is actually in closed state it cannot be reused so so uh, throughout this demo what we went through is like we our developer was on workbench he went ahead uh, moved to glappy portal to select the work item generate a unique identifier came back to workbench, triggered the promotion. If all the traceability and other uh, test case, defects, code quality was in place, Glappy uh, task gets triggered. It will verify for all those uh, information apart from uh, project checks and work item traceability. Everything was good. Uh, so it went ahead and created a service not change ticket as a system of record for the recording change, uh, driven the approval workflow from ServiceNow. ServiceNow internally had some uh, back and forth automations with ISPW, where it had a, a communication, uh, up, uh, pulled up the task list, uh, filled up the application release tab, and then uh, once the change gets implemented, uh, uh, even before uh, implementing the change, it came and updated the work rec, which is a need uh, audit need for us. And then uh, after the change getting implemented, it ended up closing the um, assignment and your change is in production. So at this point, this is all we wanted to show you, but there's uh, just one final action which would have triggered for this application is like, uh, we do have a, a subsequent step after a production validation where uh, another pipeline gets triggered just to keep our sonar queue profiles in check with uh, the latest code in production so we are not going to talk about that in this demo so i am done with the certified pipelines demo and i'll pass it back to andrew who give us closing remarks Graf, thanks, man, for the great demo. Uh, it was really awesome to see code change all the way from development and then making it into production with the full audit controls and change orders and everything um, you know that we require at Humana to release software for our members. So super awesome job um, with that demo. Thank you for walking through it. And just to kind of close up the session, um, you know, we appreciate the opportunity to present uh, to the audience today. Um, it's, uh, again, just at Humana, we are very focused on the overall um, engineer experience for our mainframe engineers. And when you connect in an awesome tool set with the automation around our release process, um, we've you know truly enabled engineers at Humana to release software to production uh, multiple times per day if they chose to in a safe and secure way. Um, so we're excited to share it with you all today. And um, if you have questions, please feel free to Hit us up in the chat. Um, Gaurav and I are, we will be available, you know, throughout the session today, and and uh, to answer any questions or Q and A. So thank you for the time today. Thank you.